I'm Chris Sturgis, and I think everybody knows that I manage the Competency Works um, website and work. And I am absolutely delighted to welcome you today um, to our webinar on spanning the grades, which is our first time that we've had a school district talking about their experiencing experience in implementing competency-based um, approaches in elementary, middle, and high school. And our presenters today are Bruce Beasley, who's the superintendent, and Karen Caprio, who's the director of curriculum and instruction. Um, now, the other thing is we're going to introduce you a little bit later to a number of other of the uh, principals and staff in um, Gray New Gloucester, or MSAD 15. Um, we'll use both languages, um, terms. And so they're in the chat room, so you can direct questions to them as well. It's very exciting. So before we start with the webinar, let me do the little bit of background about Competency Works. We're a project of the International Association for K-12 Online Learning. INICOL is a nonprofit organization with over 4,000 members focused on student-centered new learning models using online and blended learning that are competency-based. INICOL's number one policy priority is moving away from seat time to competency education, supporting policies and practices that provide more effective learning for students. INICOL is pleased to partner on the Competency Works Project with so many terrific organizations. We couldn't do this work without our partners, American Youth Policy Forum, National Governors Association, and Jobs for the Future, and our terrific advisory board. You can find um, information about our advisory board on our website. We'd like to take the opportunity to recognize the leadership um, and support of our funders, Donald K. Foundation, Carnegie Corporation, and the Nellie May Education Foundation. We specifically want to thank I appreciate Nellie May Education Foundation. They've been an outstanding partner, and their leadership, creativity, and willingness to take risks is exemplary, and we would not have Competency Works without them. So now a little bit about Competency Works. Probably everybody's been on the website. We're dedicated to creating a virtual learning space for those of you advancing competency education across the country. As you probably know, you can find blog posts written by students, teachers, principals, consultants, and state leaders sharing what they're learning. We periodically write briefing papers, and uh, we released one last week on information technology, and stay tuned. Tomorrow is um, a new uh, paper being released about state policy. Uh, and we offer the Competency-Based Pathways Wiki so that you can find additional resources when you need them. And you can also find this uh, PowerPoint on the Wiki, which I will put the, Google, the, the website up in one second. But um, if you have any problem reading it, you'll be able to find it there. This webinar will be archived, and resources can be found at the wiki. You may want to create a tab so that you can look during the webinar. And you can find the link to the wiki on the home page of the Competency website. It's right, Competency Works website is right here. And once you get to the wiki, the link to the webinar is on the right side of the wiki's home page. During the webinar, we, are highly, we highly encourage you to use the chat room. It's really important for those of you across the country um, to be able to talk to each other and get to know each other. We think this is a vital part of our conversation. Please introduce yourselves if you haven't and say where you're from and your interest in competency education. And feel free to ask questions, comments, or refer people to resources during the um, webinar. We have an incredibly knowledgeable group of innovators participating, and we really hope if there's something that you do slightly differently, we'd like to hear about it. Please ask your questions in the chat room and not use the talk button. We have, um, uh, we'll, uh, Rob and myself will both be collecting questions and we will jump in and ask the presenters um, at different points during the um, presentation. So this webinar is the last of, um, oops, that was, anyway, I jumped ahead. Anyway, this is the last webinar based on Making Mastery Works a close-up view of competency education by Nora Priest, Antonio Rudenstein, and Ephraim Weistein, who is joining us today. It was produced with the support of the Nellie May Education Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we'll be learning a bit more about that work in a second. So let me take the time to talk about the definition. It's in front of you. Um, Take a minute to reorient yourselves around the definition. States and schools are using different language to talk about competency education. And Maine and our, um, and our presenters today will use the, the language of proficiency-based. So it's very important that we have a shared definition. Uh, hopefully all of you have seen it. And if you need a more detailed one, you can find it on the wiki. 
And also you can always ask me any questions about the definition um, as we go forward. What's most important is we stay focused on quality. Competency education is not a silver bullet. And if we aren't paying attention to what's going to work for our most vulnerable kids, it's not going to actually add value to our work. So um, each one of these elements is important in setting up competency education. One piece alone does not um, make competency education. So now, um, I, as I said, we're going to uh, hear from Ephraim Weistein, who is the co-author of Making Mastery Work and the founder of Schools for the Future, and Bruce Beasley, superintendent of Gray New Gloucester School District, and Karen Caprio, director of curriculum and staff development. And um, they're going to introduce the rest of the folks who are in the chat room with us as well. So I'm now going to turn it over to Ephraim to give them give us more background about the proficiency-based pathways project. Thanks, Chris. And I assume that everyone can hear me. Let me know through the chat if you can't. So I wanted to um, just talk a little bit about the initiative and, again, acknowledge also the leadership of the Nellie Mae Education Foundation in this project. So it was intended and carried out as, in essence, a learning project, which is important in the sense that it was not a research project, but rather it was to try to answer the question, what is competency-based education and what makes it go, what makes it successful, um, and all those uh, related issues. So there were, as you probably know, seven projects funded by Nellie Mae Education Foundation. That actually represented 11 schools, and two organizations were intermediaries that worked on this project as well. So in addition to the great folks from MSAD 15 that we have on the phone today, we have um, uh, the big picture company in, from Rochester uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, and from Stores, Connecticut, where two schools represented, Boston Day and Evening Academy in Boston, Mass, Casco Bay High School in Portland, Maine, the Champion High School, which is a Diploma Plus site in Charlestown, Charleston High School, and E-Cubed Academy in Providence. The Medical Professions and Teacher Preparation Academy, which is in Connecticut, that was on a webinar a few weeks back. And lastly, Virgin's Union High School. So those are the projects, the schools that were part of the initiative. So now getting to the punchline here, what did we learn, what did we what do we think we have, we've learned in the process of this initiative? So the number one thing is, I think, a pretty good definition of what competency-based education is. And there are two absolute necessities here. One is that there first be a clear definition or target for mastery. Without that, it's impossible to have competency-based education because we don't know what the final goal is and uh, where we're trying to get to. Secondly, is um, that uh, this is based on, obviously, the flexible use of time. And it's important to note that flexible use of time does not mean that everyone is using time the same way, but rather it is being used flexibly in the pursuit of having all students meet the mastery targets. Connected to that um, is you know, the question of, well, did we see evidence of this working and being motivating for students and successful for students? And we really did hear that, and I'm actually thrilled today to hear from MSAD 15 because I heard some powerful responses from students there in two or three focus groups that I had the privilege of facilitating where students really did talk about how engaging it was for them. A, another finding, surprise, surprise, is that the current structures that we have in terms of school schedules, transcripts, and the like, those types of big technical boxes, do not easily fit competency-based education, but that uh, educators that are doing this are having to find and are finding successful ways around this. Next, that there is no push-button curriculum that's available. I often tell uh, some of the folks that I'm working with in um, some of the schools that we're piloting that if there was such a beast, we would have bought it quite a while ago, but that there's not. So in fact, it's really mixing and matching different curriculum that best meets uh, a competency-based education challenge. 
uh, next, and MSAD 15 I think is going to have lots to say about this, that there is a challenge in terms of the kind of technological and data tools that we have for being able to collect and report student progress. And that is a huge issue. And lastly is that I've been certainly talking about competency-based education, it seems like, forever. It now does seem like over the past five years there's been a policy shift and there's much more of a buzz in the field. So the hope is, and I think the expectation is, that the conditions, the external conditions, are getting better and better for the expansion and deepening of competency-based education. So I think that is the uh, what I wanted to say, but I do want to we have one final thought that Chris mentioned, which is this whole issue of differentiated learning environments. For competency-based education to work, it really does. And from this is Rob. Uh, I think we lost your audio. Um, I'm assuming other people can hear me speaking. Is that true? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you speaking. Okay. Um, yeah. I was about to turn it over to Karen Caprio, who is the Director of Curriculum and Staff Development at MSAD 15. I'm not sure if you heard my last comment, but it was about the challenge of bringing differentiation as a reality into the classroom. How do teachers and other, other professionals actually facilitate a classroom in which you might have five or six different levels of students doing work, working on different standards. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Karen, this is Rob. If you're uh, speaking, we're not hearing you. Okay, let me try that. How's that, Rob? Okay, so we, you, you can hear me now? Okay, thanks. So I just said thanks to Ephraim and thank you to Chris that Bruce and I are happy to be here today to share our journey. We've been on this journey for about four years. Uh, we feel like one thing we have learned is that you're never there, so we want to make everybody aware of that up front, that we don't feel like we've arrived yet. Uh, we'll share a little bit about our journey and then leave time for questions, because I think you'll learn more probably from asking questions than from things that we'll just try to fill your head with. But uh, with us today, we have some exceptional staff members from SAD 15 who have also been on this journey with us for four years. And there are their names and pictures. Feel free to jot their names down, and if you have questions about a particular um, grade level, then you can um, chat with them. The one, the one change we had to make was Will Putnam was not available to be with us today, so Erin McGuire, who is another fabulous teacher from the high school, she teaches math, is on the call with us. So if you have a high school question, you would direct that to Erin McGuire. Uh, Again, I just want to reiterate one more time that everything we talk about today is a work in progress, that we are constantly revising and updating and challenging our own thinking as we work through this process. We are a rural school district in southern Maine with 2,000 students, and we're spread over five schools ranging from uh, pre-K to 12. Our students are about 99% Caucasian, we're about 30% economically disadvantaged, and we have about 15% special education. Our district has managed to keep class sizes small, ranging from about 18 to 22 in the primary elementary level to a max of about 25 in middle school. Like so many districts, we have reformed for years. We have purchased programs. We have rewritten the curriculum. We have engaged in 
professional development, and still that uh, student achievement needle was barely inching upward. Additionally, the curriculum that we had was a mile wide and an inch deep, and there were varying degrees of implementation of curriculum, and it was creating a Swiss cheese effect for our students. Our dropout rate has been roughly around 3% each year, and we could see students becoming increasingly disengaged. And you couple that with all the bad news that we all hear nationally about students making it to the university and needing remedial courses, and we knew that we had to do something dramatically different. But despite all of these changes, we knew that our students were extraordinary, and our families are supportive, and our staff is committed to doing the right things for kids. So about uh, a month ago, I was asked to do a, um, an overview for our school board about what has the journey been for the past four years. You know, what have you guys been doing? And so you can see here that the journey has been quite busy. Um, again, we are constantly refining the system. And if you uh, pay attention to the bottom half of this slide, you will see one of the challenges is vocabulary. We started this transformation thinking we were going to be creating a standards-based system. We quickly moved to performance-based. And then it was customized learning. And then it was really um, through our work with Nellie May Education Foundation, who generously supported a full year of this transformation work with us, providing staff release time, summer time. Um, it was the opportunity to work together. It was our introduction and support from Ephraim that we were really able to catapult, I think, our system forward in a very positive way. But on this slide, um, we, we basically, as Chris said, are calling our system now a proficiency-based system. And all of those um, projects going across the top of the slide, you'll see over the years from 2009 to 2012, those are all of the things that we have accomplished. And you'll see as we're into this year, some of our challenges are grading at the high school level and uh, habits of mind and complex reasoning, 21st century type skills. So this is Bruce Beasley, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, the MSAD 15 journey started in uh, 2009. Uh, we were given the opportunity to partner with the Maine Department of Education and the Reinventing Schools Coalition to really transform our system. Um, this initial phase helped us to come together as a district to really look at our achievement gaps in a systemic manner. Because for far too long, the conversation always fell on, well, if those teachers the year before or if that school that these kids were in the year before would do better, we'd be able to do something with them at this grade level or at this school. So we fell into that trap. And what that initial training really taught us is that we, were really, we weren't going to embark on another reformation. We weren't just going to try to reshape you know, the clay and come up with something different and see what we get for results we were really preparing to take on second order change. That change that's really hard, change that's transforming, but change that we knew was valuable. And in order for this transformation to really be successful, we knew that we all had to commit to working together. It was going to take all staff, all students, all parents. So our journey started really with a four-day workshop in August back in 2009, and that was led by the Reinventing Schools Coalition. They shared their four pillars that they believed were essential for transformation. The four pillars were shared vision, leadership, a standards-based design, and continuous improvement. This training was essential because it created a broad base of support, support for our change. We had all school administrators. We had five of 11 uh, board of directors members were there, and many of them used their personal vacation time to attend. We had several teachers from all grade levels. And there were a large number of interested parents. In total, we had about 75 bodies learning this model of standards-based at the time over those four very hot days in late summer. At the end of those four days, we came to an agreement as a system that we wanted to implement one very simple first step, to, and that was to continue to learn more about the model and all four of its pillars. This was to be, there was to be a commitment that we were going to train additional staff, but the bulk of our energy would be on the foundational piece of setting a vision, sharing a vision with students, with staff, and with community. So from the very first step that we took in this journey, our focus 
was a district perspective. It was never about an elementary school. It was never about uh, you know what we could do better at the middle school, what tweak could we make at the high school. It was a really a district perspective from the very first uh, gathering that we had. You'll notice that one of the reinventing schools pillars is PDCA, plan, do, check, and adjust. This process is extremely critical to the ongoing monitoring of systems, processes, and procedures. It's, it, you can't wait an entire school year to check and adjust what you tried to put in place. It really requires you to do it all the time. If something is not working, something that you've tried is not working, check in with it. Adjust it. Our advice is to make sure that there is this system in place that monitors your progress, checks and adjusts if something is not working or if a plan needs to be different. In addition to having those school-wide systems for checking and adjusting, the board also created a, a district council, and that's referred to as our academic advisory committee. And that committee is charged with overseeing this initiative, this transformation. This group includes teacher leaders, administrators, board members, parents, and it meets once a month. And at that meeting, we put our goals into action. We establish next steps, and we really try to keep a focus on that K-12 perspective. The group has established a path for the district. Each school is responsible for bringing back the, to their respective buildings the implementation of that path. And leadership reports out at each of those meetings uh, to the full group uh, how their process is going, where they're, where they're having stumbling uh, blocks, and how we overcome those. So was this, an easy was this an easy task? Absolutely not. We were met with many naysayers, the here we go again, the been there, done that. How is this different than the other gazillion initiatives that, that we've tried, or they're just putting more on our plate? While it's frustrating to be met with that negativity initially, you can't, there was a tremendous amount of excitement and potential. People saw the potential in the idea, and we stuck together. We used the meeting process, the tools, to keep our meetings on track and to keep them focused. We do recommend that you use Two Time for Education. It's published by Langford as a resource. We use it all the time. The process tools are especially helpful in getting all voices to be heard, not just the loudest, because that's what will happen. You'll hear that loudest voice, and they'll try to hijack the agenda. But if you have a system in place that gets all voices heard and gives credibility to all of them, it's very helpful. We were not very far into our process when we realized that two distinct categories were emerging that we really needed to give attention to, the structures of our school and the instruction at our school. With those two things in mind, we suggest that you acknowledge right away that you cannot do it all. You have to take small steps, will work better, and if you take those small steps, it will be beneficial in the long run. And so from there, um, we launched into our first goal, and that was about the revisioning process. And we used just some simple questions. The first question we asked parents, staff, and staff was, what makes a great school? And so you can see here what the responses were from each of those groups. And I think you'll also see, as you go through these next few slides, the similarities of what parents think makes a great school and what staff thinks makes a great school. So you know, respectful relationships, communication, having high standards, safe environment, all of the things that you hear every day. We asked them what skills and knowledge will students need for the 21st century. And parents said technological, multicultural, literacy and math, social personal, and staff responded technology, communication, and social skills. Then we asked, what are your hopes and dreams for your child or to the teachers, your students? And parents here in our district want happy and healthy students, children. They want lifelong learners, and they want them to be successful at whatever they do. And you can see here, again, very similar responses from our staff. They want productive citizens, lifelong learners, and humanitarians. We then took the, the next step was we wanted to talk to our business community. And so we asked them the same questions, you know, what do, similar questions. What do you need from our students when they graduate from high school? And you can see here, there, here are the responses, and I've bolded out, you know, the pieces. And what you'll see is, well, 
some academic content surely is important. It's not the only thing that's important. If you've done any work with 21st century skills or guiding principles, you'll see those are the things that rose to the top for our business community. You know, getting along with your, your fellow workers, your ability to be self-directed, uh, being able to accept criticism, all of those are really important uh, as students graduate into the world of work or college. So all of this data was then really put together into a draft vision, which was discussed and debated over a number of meetings. And then a final draft was finally voted on and approved by the Board of Directors. As you look at this vision that you see on your screen, hopefully you'll see evidence of what the parents shared, what the staff shared, what the, com what the community had for a vision for their schools. One of the significant changes in this version over what was our previous vision is that it really listed all students. And that's really the, the foundation of proficiency-based system, attending to all students' needs. The prior ver version of our vision really talked about affording students the opportunity. Well, this new vision really goes beyond just putting the opportunity out there. We as a district wanted to accept the responsibility that all students will reach the vision, and that we saw that as our responsibility. And then the next step was for each of our schools to take that vision once it was approved by the school board and make it their own in their school. So to, to go through a process of uh, unpacking, we, we call it, that vision and making it something that would have meaning to students. And here's an example of a middle school, how our middle school unpacked this vision to identify what was valued at their level. Each school across the district went through a similar process so that that district vision would come alive and have meaning for all students. So then we redesigned our annual parent climate survey. We send the parent climate survey out every year, and it really informs our school improvement process to align with these goals of high expectations, personalized learning, communication, resource management. And when schools worked on their school level vision, um, while the schools were doing that work, the board was taking their next step of identifying their four broad goals for the system. And here they are. You see them, high expectations, personalized learning, resource management. And what that does is it tells every staff member, every community member, that this is where the district is going. We're all working on this common vision. It sets that clear expectation. So what you'll see is now these, guide, these goals guide and inform our strategic direction. And every school, every committee, every group uses these goals to align their specific, goal, their specific goals. And I'm, Karen's telling me that the slide is not there. Okay. Let's click it one more, see if it's there. It's not there. Okay. The board identified four basic times. We check in. The board checks in and adjusts their strategic plan, just like we asked the schools to do it. And we do that four times a year, January, August, October, November, and then late December, we'll check in. So from a board perspective, it was really essential that we establish the foundation for visioning and strategic planning for all. And at the same time that the board was doing that work, uh, which actually uh, spanned about a two-year period. And even though it's just four years in, we're now having conversations about, again, checking and adjusting in on that vision, the mission, and our strategic planning process. So again, things are never really done. But at the same time, you know, instructionally, we also had a framework to guide our process. And we call this our classroom design and delivery model. This, again, is a tool that was adapted from our training with RIF. This instructional design builds and maintains a cohesive instructional model, and it creates tools and processes for teachers and students to navigate their learning. There are five boxes. You'll see them numbered that go around the page. The first one is model the moral purpose to inspire systemic change. That provides us an opportunity to inspire everyone in the community to be a leader. This is not just principals and superintendents or teacher leaders making this change. This is all of us having to be leaders at some point and to behave in a collegial manner. In box two, which is creating a learner-centered culture, is the opportunity for that vision work that we've taken um, part in, as well as 
taking that vision to the next step of take, you know, you have your classroom vision, now how does that translate into a code of conduct or some classrooms call that a code of cooperation? How are we going to behave in this classroom in order to achieve that vision? Uh, in box three, it says create procedural transparency in a learner-centered classroom. And I think this is really the crux of transformation for us at this point. It is really about making the learning transparent, making the expectations transparent for students. This is where teachers also have the opportunity to establish some standard operating procedures in the classroom. And these procedures teach students how to navigate the day in the event that the teacher is busy or tied up with another student. Um, the classroom SOPs help guide the student to his or her next steps. And then in box four, developing transparency so students can navigate. Again, it's the heart of what we do to support teaching and learning. But unless you have laid the, found, the, the groundwork in boxes one, two, and three, then uh, creating this, developing this type of transparency will not be possible. And then it moves into box five, which is create a plan to achieve your desired outcomes. And you know, we're still working here, but we know that this is where unit planning uh, happens where we can um, also provide any time, any place opportunities for students. It's finding creative ways to really engage students in their learning. And, and again, this is another one of those areas. This will, be, this will never be done. This will be in the constant uh, revision. The, thing, the, the one thing that I reflect on this classroom design, and I give our staff, our teachers, uh, a lot of credit for this because we've had hundreds of visitors to our district. And Every single time when the principals debrief with those visitors at the end of the day, the one aha that they share with us is they are amazed at how well our students can articulate their own learning and their own process. And I really have to say kudos to our staff because I really believe that it is this, these foundational pieces that enable students to be able to talk in that way. I'm just going to jump in and share one quick thing with that. It's not just about the visitors to the schools. That voice of those students is going to be critical to any district that makes a similar change because those students are going to be your best communicators home to the families. Remember, they, these students are going home to families that have been taught in a system of education that hasn't changed for over 100 years. And so parents are going to be confused by it. Parents are going to have questions about it. What do you mean by um, a, a capacity matrix? What do you mean by you know, a rubric or whatever those conversations are. And those students, the more they understand, the more they can communicate it, the, the, the more transparent it becomes, the better understood the parents get it. And that's a critical piece of this whole movement. And now I want to show you just a few examples because that's the other thing we always hear from visitors is they come into the classrooms and they say, oh, I see that now because of the work that our teachers have done. Um, so here are just a few examples from classrooms. This is an example of a standard that a teacher has unpacked, and it's a primary uh, classroom. They've unpacked the standard into student-friendly language so that a student knows exactly what the expectations are. Our elementary schools uh, unpack it into what they call the I can statement. This next slide is an example of a life-size rubric that's being used to monitor student progress on learning, how to form an appropriate line. We take that for granted or we just assume kids know how to make an appropriate line. Well, this teacher took it to the next step. She actually has pictures there to show the students with visual clues, you know, what does a, a two line look like? Well, it means we're getting there, but we're not quite there. And she gives them a visual of what they would look like and, sh and she gives them words as well to support. In the third picture, this is an example of how teachers set goals with students. This graphic helps students see visually what the expectations are, and it helps them monitor progress towards meeting their own goals. You will see down the left-hand side that this also is wrapped in a plan, do, check, adjust model. This next slide is an example of a middle school and their team's shared vision and code of conduct or code of cooperation. Teachers work with students to develop these tools. It's not something that the teacher does without the input of the student. Then these tools are used to monitor the class and provide reminders to students about expectations. 
And that is key. If you just create the tools and post them on the, the uh, bulletin board, then you haven't changed anything. You have to keep going back to these tools and keeping them alive for students. And then these next two slides are just like in a traditional classroom. The teachers post reminders for students with due dates. You'll notice at the top it says teacher pace. Initially when we started our process, we had attended some training that talked about the standards-based movement really um, being student-paced. And we ran into some difficulty with that. So trying to take the issue out of, um, of time out of the equation I think was the goal behind saying it was student pace, you know, then let the students work at their own pace. But during a check and adjust early on, we realized that there were some who were taking that very literally, as if we were going to let the students, you know, pace themselves at a very slow pace, if, if that's what the student chose. And of course that was not our intention. Um, so changing it to teacher pace really helped many teachers and it really helped allay fears that parents had that we were going to allow their students to somehow, um, you know, slack off because that was not our intent. And again, this is another example of, you know, something you would see in a proficiency-based classroom as well as a traditional classroom, just reminders for students, always letting students know what the expectations are. And then finally, this example is the student checklist, which displays exemplars of exceptional student work, uh, providing these examples allow students to see exactly what the assignments look like at each of our proficiency levels. So as I mentioned earlier, transformation is, is hard work, it's second order change, it's heavy lifting, and it's, it's going to be, you know, you, you'll need many hands to help. We've been very fortunate um, that we have been supported by uh, the Nellie May Foundation, the Department of Education, uh, Next Generation Learning, uh, CCSSO, which is the Chief Counsel of State School Officers. Um, we've had a lot of partners in this work. And, and this partnership and these opportunities uh, has given us uh, tremendous exposure to like-minded professionals from all across the country, all across the state, uh, who, are, who are at varying levels of implementation. Um, the goals of the partnership were a perfect fit for us, from personalized learning, anytime, anyplace learning, comprehensive system of support, world-class knowledge skills, uh, student agency, give, letting students be agents of their own learning. As Karen said, some of them need to prod a little bit to keep at, at teacher pace, but giving them a voice, giving them some choice, let them advocate for some of their own learning. And these are all areas that we want our system to include. Uh, a caution here, though, is that you can, you know, you can take off more than, than you can reasonably do, and that's the last thing that, that you want to do. You really need to, you know, have a clear plan, have, have a lot of support under it, because it's very heavy lifting. Um, with, a, with the generous support of the Nellie May Foundation, uh, and they did support a full year of our work, um, we were able to get a lot of teacher release time and summer time. And what we've learned through that is that um, even with that, time, there will still be teachers that will be at, you know, a struggle. But we use those teacher leaders to get into classrooms, to host other teachers from the district, to see the work that was being done, and we found that beneficial. Um, as you saw in the pictures, we have a number of elementary teachers that use a lot of pictures to help remind students, whether it's the line in the hall or getting ready for the end of the day, getting ready to go to lunch, those standard operating procedures. At the middle school, the teachers use individual matrices and checklists that help guide students. And we are using an online tool that tracks student progress. Um, at the high school, we've articulated the standards in every course syllabus. So when you look at an Algebra I course, underneath of that is, is a list of the standards that those students will cover in Algebra I. Um, English Language Arts for Grade 9 has specific proficiencies identified. And we're in the process of creating and refining those common assessments, getting that language, those rubrics down for those power standards. Um, the high school is interesting because they have had, they have a much higher stake. Any high school, doesn't matter. They have a higher stake because parents want to know what is the transcript going to look like at the end? How will my student be competitive when they apply to Harvard? with students that are graduating from a traditional high school or, or another high school. And, and so that's very interesting. The state, the state legislature did approve, and in, in, in Karen's chart before you saw LD 1422, 
they did identify that students will graduate to standards by 2018. So every district, and we're in that process right now, of rewriting our graduation policy. How much, how impactful is a Carnegie credit when that's really based on the amount of seat time? When we're really looking at has the child met the standards that they would require for an eligible one quote unquote Carnegie credit. As you start down this process, you're going to find that there are a number of structures within the school, with the school day starting and ending at 7.30, ending at 2 o'clock, being guided by the bus routes or something else. And, and those are often roadblocks in the process. And so you have to be able to knock those roadblocks down and find ways around those, find ways over those. There are structures that we have in our traditional day that really set students up for failure. Things like schedules and grading and, you know, those, those would be a couple. Uh, for a student who struggles early on and by December it's mathematically impossible to make up a grade in Algebra 1, what do they do? They give up. They disengage. They're not committed to the process. So we have had to really look at our high school schedule and say, okay, how do we break this into smaller chunks? So if a student isn't doing well in the first you know, few standards, how do we remediate them? How do we keep them on track? We're not going to go on to the next, the next standard because this is where the, we, we feel like this is where the student disengages. So we had to really, really rethink our structures. We had to think about how our, how our schedule was built into some flexible modules, into some flexible teams at the elementary and middle school level where, you know, we could group like students in math that may not have been the same in English. And so we put some flexible grouping teams in place. Um, and it really allowed us an opportunity to knock down some of those structures. And when we hit bumps in the road and we, we, you know, like we didn't have to wait all year to make changes, it was a perfect opportunity to, to put, the, put that, those systems in place. The power of technology, as you know, in Maine, all students, seventh grade uh, in the middle school, have one-to-one -one access. In our district, we have one-to-one -one access for 7th graders to 12th graders. They all have the same device for, that we purchased through the main laptop initiative. Our plan is to purchase that same device for 5th and 6th graders. So we understand the power of technology and the power that that has in creating a standards-based system that supports students and give them opportunity to anytime, anywhere learning. And at this point, Bruce and I'd like to share just a few of the lessons learned. Um, and, and one of the things that we want to make sure we share with you is that no matter where you start in the process <clears throat> is to focus on the best instructional practices that lead to student learning. Be sure that your staff, no matter what model you might um, train with, or you know, be sure that your staff is using a balanced instructional model that does include direct instruction. That is another um, sort of a road, not, not really a bump in the road, I'll call it. Um, there was some uh, concern that students were instructing themselves in this model. <clears throat> yeah, or that uh, it was a bunch of worksheets that students would just complete in order to show that they had met a standard. And we want to be really clear, that is not the kind of a system that we want to build. And that we do value that uh, students have contact with staff, with teachers. We believe that teachers are the most important piece of anything in the classroom. And so direct instruction every day is important. That said, it may not be whole group direct instruction. It may be some days on some topics. But for at least every day, there should be some small group direct instruction. And again, because students are in varying places, that small group direct instruction would make the most sense. Uh, Another, another real key here is that you make sure you involve parents and students in the process. This isn't just about teachers and administrators and school board members that want to make a change. If this is really going to live and it's going to survive, you really need the voices from parents and students. And what you'll do, what you'll find out is that timing is really important in terms of how you communicate the work that's going on. Your staff has to be comfortable, your students have to be comfortable about the changes before they can really talk fluently about them with parents. And sometimes staff doesn't feel 100% comfortable or 100% honest when parents are in the room. So there's always that, is it really a transparent process there? So, you know, make sure you provide time to work with your staff, get your teacher leaders, Beacon teachers trained, let them be the voice, get a consistent message 
and then work with staff. Differentiate your, your professional development for staff so that you have staff members that can be all along the range of, of implementation, but they're getting their needs met. We made a commitment in our new teacher orientation that all new teachers to our district will be, we will go through the design and delivery model with them. We use our teacher leaders to have breakout sessions with our new staff to the district and they talk about what, what does, how do we create a shared vision at an elementary level, at a middle school level, at a high school? What standard operating procedure look like? It's how we do business. And that's the message that gets sent to every new teacher through our teacher leadership. So make sure you provide that staff that time and know that all teachers are not going to be at the same level at the same time. Just like students aren't at the same level at the same time. So you're going to need to differentiate your professional development. But the, the, the end goal never changes. And also going along with that is, you know, you cannot engage your staff enough either, especially around vocabulary and expectations. Uh, there have been a number of times that we've all been in the same meeting, thought we had the same understanding when we left, but it wasn't long before we would discover that some of us may be implementing things a little bit differently so that there was really a misunderstanding. Uh, this is difficult because we're all pressed for time every single day. But if you if you just take you know smaller steps, take it slow. We we really believe that that will pay you dividends in the end because you may not you know have some of the troubles that we ran into. And also, I think Bruce might have said this, but to make sure your students understand this process because they are the best communication that you will have between home and school. Uh, if you haven't already, you will need to start rethinking professional time. You know how. How much, how much time do you have for your staff to work together because they're going to need lots of time? As you begin the journey, as you start the journey, as you work in the process, you're going to have teachers, pioneers that are way out there. They get way out in front and they're willing to push these initiatives ahead, they really push those initiatives ahead of the whole group. And you'll learn a lot from their trial and error. But you have to really think about how that impacts other teachers. Are you turning other teachers away? Are you, um, when those pioneers get way out in front, you got a group that's, you know, that's so far ahead, are they, are they, you know, how are the other teachers getting their needs met? So um, make sure that you uh, have a plan for implementing each step of the process. Uh, when those teacher leaders get out in front and they have momentum going, Sometimes that can appear as though they're rolling over the other staff. Plan, do, check, and adjust with them. Step back and say, okay, we know that you got this work. What can you do to support those teachers that are behind so they see it as still a group effort, not just a, you know, 10 teachers that are way out in front of everybody and will never catch up because that can slow down your process significantly. And then a caution that um, we want to share is that our advisory or our oversight committee while well intentioned, it started to be seen as a competition between schools. You know, if one school came and reported a lot of success or one was struggling, it made for some difficult conversations. So if you're going to use an oversight committee to uh, shepherd this work, make sure that you have the right group in the room for these conversations because they can be tough conversations. And make sure that that group is not too large. And Finally, um, I would say you need to remind your staff that you are creating a system that needs to be sustainable, replicable, and manageable. Those are three important words because you will have staff, Bruce just talked about them a little bit, your pioneers. They'll be willing to put in 10 hours a day, every day, all summer because they see the value in what they're, what they're doing, what they're trying to do. But if you then create a system that requires that kind of time, you're going to be doomed from the start. So again, make sure that the system you build is sustainable, replicable, and manageable. So like I said earlier, in 2009 we started our journey and our plan was that it would take us five years to implement this system. Well, now that we're about four years into it, we know that it's going to take more than five years and, that, and that's okay um, because it was important for us to, to check and adjust. And I, I share this at a lot of different conferences that I, that I, that I go to or that I share at. You, you, can't, um, you can't jump in on the path and think that, you know, all that other stuff that SAD 15 did before wasn't important. The shared visioning work, 
the, the teacher beacon work. All those pieces were really, really important for sustainability, for leadership. And so, as, and I'm not sure who it was that mentioned earlier, but it's not a program that you can buy in a box. You don't back a truck up to the door and unload a standards-based program. There's a lot of foundational work that has to be done before you can talk about unpacking a standard and power standards and learning progressions that fall under those power standards. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and don't expect that you can take that shortcut and just jump in. We're at a place right now where our next steps include looking, really looking at data teams and we talk about professional time, putting teams of teachers together that really look at standards and, and regrouping students based on their progression towards standards. And uh, those data teams will use all the formative assessments that we have in place that will guide those decisions because while instruction is important, what we're really focused on is student learning. Not what did the teacher teach, but what did the student learn? And how do we deal with the student that got it early? And how do we deal with the student that didn't get it? And those are the conversations that should be taking place in our data team structure. We are working with our vendors as we refine our recording and reporting tool. Right now, we are, we are, we've invested heavily in Educate uh, as our reporting tool. And how do we make that so that it's a report that the student, the teachers, the parents look at, teachers keep up to date, and when the parents look at it, it's providing them exact information in terms of where their child is in regards to the standards. Because that's another piece. If we have a good reporting tool, why do we need to have report cards at the end of every quarter or at the end of a trimester? Why isn't a report card available to a parent every day, every week? You know, if we, if we can create a system that they understand and that the teachers can keep updated, this, we can do away with quarters and trimester report cards. There's a lot of policy development that will need to change as you move to standards. If your policies refer to Carnegie credits, how much more, does, how much, how much more emphasis do we put on that? If we're, our focus is really on learning, not on seat time. In Maine, like I said, we have LD 1422, which requires us to look at students graduating standard. The following suggestion that I'm going to make is, is this, the heavy lifting. You need a strong model of teacher leadership. These leaders can help with many components of transformation. They can help with instruction. They can help with assessment. They can help with reporting. And we've been blessed that we have, you know, we have tremendous teacher leadership. We have tremendous administrative leadership that hasn't changed much in the last you know, five years. So the message has always been the same. The, the work plan has not, has not swayed. So we have network, get, it, involve yourself with networks and partnerships. We have the, the main cohort for customized learning here that we're a part of. It's like 25 schools around the state serves 50,000 students that are all working to create a standards-based system. So those networks, those partnerships, they're really important. It's hard to share our four-year journey in just this short amount of time, but I hope that you've heard that, you know, we're really working at it. I'm not going to tell you it's perfect, but we're taking on the challenge. We are transforming our district. We're gaining a lot of momentum. We've got a lot of pieces in place. We've got a lot of work to do. I invite questions for Karen and I or any of the other staff members that are on the call and certainly hope you found the presentation benef beneficial. Hi, this is Chris. Oh my gosh, you guys, this has been fantastic. I, um, I think everybody's been just wrapped listening to this. So there, we have four different questions. One is, let's just start with this one. Could, we, could you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about the common core and how that's um, getting integrated into your work? Yeah. Uh, the Common Core actually came out or was released at the exact same time that we started this work. So in that respect, that was kind of perfect. So we had two weeks in the summer where our staff got together and really dissected the Common Core. And there were some, some staff members on this call, actually, who are, I would call, experts at the Common Core. Uh, so everything that we do right now is based in Common Core for ELA and math. Look at that, as we look at that common core, one of the things that we're really working at is, and through work with a couple different assessment groups that have been in the district doing training, knowing that some of those you're just going to formatively assess. They might be a checklist. They might be something that you're just, you know, dotting a radio button. 
but there are power standards that everything should fit under. You should be able to identify power standards with each level of math of the common core and then under those you have those learning progressions that you know the teacher formatively assessments leading formatively assesses leading up to a big summit of assessment on that power standard. So we do take that common core and we unpack it and then we repack it. Great, thank you. Um, so the, another question that came up was, and I'm going to just I'm going to try to organize these questions. Was as you think about how students are organized currently, we use great um, age-based cohorts. As you as um, schools, both elementary, middle, and high school are organizing students, how, how is that being done? Are you using leveling? Does it change based on the different age of the students? Bruce, Karen, did you guys hear my question? Okay, let me try again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we do have grade levels in the district, and we also have multi grade teams especially at our middle school where those folks are really looking at students in levels. So even if you're even if we're using grade levels, we're not saying that just because you're six you have to be in the first grade. If you're six but you're working at a third grade level, then you'll be in third grade standards. You'll be working on third grade standards. We have a we have a lot of vertical teams in the district that really you know like a fifth sixth seventh eighth grade team at the middle school and they share students all across those grade levels so it's not uncommon for a fifth grade student to be sitting in with seventh graders or eighth graders in a math class if the, if that's the standard that those students are working on so we really try to put structures in place that's the structures piece that allow for that flexibility across grade levels and gives the opportunity for those students to be with their same age peers on a number of other levels, such as in phys ed class or you know, at lunchtime. And I also want to add that one of the struggles that we face right now is, you know, is it more important to accelerate through levels or go deeper into a level? And so those are the conversations that we're having now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the issue of going deeper or going faster is a very, it's a fascinating uh, discussion that's coming up a, a, around the country in different competency-based schools. I think we'll be hearing a lot more about that. There's lots of other questions and um, I'm going to just, because of time, um, have to wrap this up. I'm sure we could go for another half hour easily. Um, so let me first thank Bruce and Karen. This has been fantastic and I hope to get your notes because I think we're going to figure out other ways to share this um, because it's just been, I think, probably one of the most instrumental and certainly our first look from a district perspective. I also really want to thank the rest of the um, Grain New Gloucester team who are in the chat room who have been answering questions and providing a lot of depth and, and responding to um, our participants in a personalized way so their questions are getting answered as they ask them. So that's been fantastic. Um, so let me just wrap up quickly because I know everybody has to go on to their next meeting. Uh, this was our last of our Making Mastery Work webinars. Thanks to the Denali May Education Foundation for making this all possible. You can find the previous webinars on the wiki. They are archived and you can listen to them and see the materials and um, see different resources. And our upcoming webinars, one more this week at 3 to 4 on Thursday with Susan Patrick and Liz Glauer who will be talking about re-engineering information technology. Anybody who has um, read that paper knows that there is, uh, it's just jam-packed with incredible information and ideas and this is a chance to really engage with Liz and, um, and talk about what the implications are for your districts and schools. And then on Thursday, March 21st, balancing on the lear learning edge, we actually have Nick, um, Donahue, the president of the Nellie May Education Foundation, is going to join us for an opening because the issue of uh, supports and making sure that we've actually strategically set up supports is so important to making sure that we can have quality implementation of competency education. Laura Shabilla from the Harvard um, 
from Harvard School of Education. She is in a PhD program and also a leader in overage undercredited students. Um, the, the work on the behalf of overage undercredited students will be joining us. And we'll be having an in-depth talk about how schools are providing support and what we can start to do to be more strategic in that work. So once again, thanks to I, Nicole, for every, thanks for everybody, and have a wonderful day. Thanks.